Hello students and welcome to the today's class. Today we will be discussing about the non-agrarian economic pursuits which were prevalent in ancient Mesopotamian society. The objectives of the today's lecture include to know about the economic conditions of ancient Mesopotamia in relation to craft production and trading patterns. You will be able to learn about the use of marine navigation systems in urban economy. You will also understand the increasing use of money in non-agrarian economy and you will be able to understand the significance of urbanism in early Mesopotamia. Since we are going to discuss the subsistence strategies of ancient Mesopotamians in addition to agriculture which I have discussed in another lecture, here we are going to focus only on some non-agrarian pursuits that were prevalent in ancient Mesopotamian territories. Now to begin with, I will be talking about various aspects of trading patterns first. By trade, we mean the local, regional and international exchange of goods. Trade related details are found in company agreements, merchandise manifestos, trade letters and government documents. At a number of uh, archaeological sites, the items from different distant areas have been discovered. Many items which were produced either by surface or in the workshops of temples or palaces, they served as a medium of barter for the importation of metal, stone, lumber, spices and even fragrances. Essentially, trade took place between foreign towns and other trading outposts. Despite lacking many important features, tribes also participated in commercial relations based on different treaties. The sources confirm that there was foreign trade along the Euphrates River into the Mediterranean littoral and the Persian Gulf. Consequently, trade helped in raising standard of living in Mesopotamia and spreading influence of the Mesopotamian civilization in different regions. The majority of the everyday necessities including for example grains, date palms, wild and domesticated animals for food, clothes made of animal hides, fur or fleece, clay for creating pottery, soil and water for manufacturing you know, bricks and basic wood and stone for construction were all probably readily available within Mesopotamia. In order to preserve the status and position of both royal residences and temples, luxury objects were thus imported. It was due to various risks. Only kings, queens, powerful leaders and wealthy temple estates purchased a number of luxurious commodities. Raw material and finished goods from many regions including Laps Lazuli, which was coming from Badakhshan in Afghanistan, reached Mesopotamia over the course of several centuries. These goods traveled to Mesopotamia and Egypt via a sophisticated network of overland trade routes. Many commodities also arrived through sea from different areas including the Indus Valley system. Under Sargon the Great, Agade served the capital of the first great empire in Mesopotamia. Sargon first conquered most of the southern Iraq and subsequently followed old trade routes up to the Euphrates to gain hegemony of two main commercial centers. One was Mari on the middle Euphrates and second was Alba in the northern Syria. These cities were strategically and economically important as they were located at very important trade routes. The records found at Mari contain references about wine which was considered as the beverage of the wealthy. In the 3rd millennium BC, Alba served as the primary hub for the trade in metals. In their expansionist endeavors, 
Sagan and his successors advanced as far as Elam along the eastward trade routes. Military courts enhanced the flow of goods from regions that were firmly under the control of the imperial center. Those areas which were not governed by Sargon were engaged in a limited trade. Now coming to the transportation part of this trading mechanism. Since the Tigris and Euphrates rivers as well as their network of streams and canals were used to reach different trading areas, the shipping of products through water was well organized method of transportation in ancient Mesopotamia. The Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean both have navigable waters and it is possible that the Phoenicians traveled all the way around Africa. Local regions developed their own style of river craft, but seagoing ships were influenced by the fleets of the Levantine coast and possibly the Aegean also. When water transport was not conceivable, human porters and draught animals including donkeys and mules were used. Wheeled vehicles were known in the ancient Near East from around 3500 BCE onwards. Yet, the muddy conditions of the alluvial plains made sledges more practical. In one of the entries in the royal cemetery of Ur, a sledge was drawn by a pair of cattle in Queen Pobi's tomb. Sledges transported heavy loads such as the enormous stone winged bull colossi of different palaces. The ancient Near East had many unpaved roads, but they had to be leveled, swept out, and those meant for valid transit have to be kept in good condition by the local authorities. Small rivulets and shallow rivers were bridged whenever possible, and large rivers were crossed at fords or on ferry boats. The records of the third dynasty of Ur add little to existing information on the inter-regional trade routes. A messenger from the Phoenician city of Byblos first mentioned and elucidated an indirect link between Egypt and southern Mesopotamia. In the third millennium BC, smaller or medium-sized state territories were mostly involved in trade because most of the overland trade was subject to the shifting circumstances of foreign policy, which kept large or prosperous states aloof from trading activities. Custom duties of many kinds were exacted, and the rate was rarely established. However, the princes who controlled overland trade among the Sumerians were able to conclude treaties with neighboring princes concerning the production of trade and it is smooth functioning also. Sometimes conflicts rose if the terms of trade arrangements were broken. Consequently, it would have been difficult for a local authority to reject an agreement to preserve the caravans. The poems which glorify the Akkadian imperial kings also contain references about merchants who asserted their claim before the king. The textual sources made reference to the same routes that had been used for decades for the movement of army, transfer of supplies, and even the travel of diplomats and businessmen. Now coming to another aspect of trade, which is the river transport system. Riverine traffic in ancient Mesopotamia was always substantial. Cuneiform tablets from different Mesopotamian historical periods record the transportation of grain, cattle, fish, milk, vegetables, oil, fruit, wool, stone, brick, leather, and people over the network of canals. For the smooth functioning of river trade, many clay canal maps they were utilized. At the end of the 3rd millennium BCE, the Akkadian king Shar Kali Shari sent a naval force to conquer the island sand coasts of the Persian Gulf on which Mesopotamia was dependent for many essential commodities. As early as the 3rd millennium BCE, 
Mesopotamian sea-going ships sailed to distant but at times unknown lands for raw materials, including Harappan ports on the Arabian Sea. Dilmun, for example, served as a port of exchange through which goods such as gold, copper, lapis lazuli, pearls, and ivory, including draw and manufactured items like combs, boxes, figurines, and furniture decorations, then dates and onions, they were traded. Delmon onions were cited in the economic texts dating back to the 24th century BCE. Timber from distant areas was transported to Lagash, Uma, and other southern cities of Mesopotamia. Delmon, which has been identified with the Bahrain Islands, was one of the important trading posts. In the early 2nd millennium BC, trade was very much under royal supervision. There were checkpoints along the Euphrates River, and merchants going by the ships were unable to pass through these checkpoints without an official permit, which was known as the Tablet of the King. The temple organized the standard systems of weights and measures used in Mesopotamia, Dilman and Miloha had their own system. Magan, which has been identified with Oman, was another important trading post. In the collection of prayers, Magan was called the home of copper and also the source of the black stone for the several statues of Jodia of Lagash. The other items, such as okre, semi-precious stones, and ivory were also acquired in Magan on behalf of Ur temple complex. During the old Akkadian and third dynasty of Ur periods, Meloha also traded with Mesopotamia. Meloha was a source of black wood, gold, ivory, and carnelian items. These goods were either native to Meloha or were only shipped from more distant places. Despite the prominence of the Persian Gulf trade, there are little evidences about how the ships actually looked like. Shipping in the Persian Gulf was controlled by the Elamites, who traveled to the coast of Oman and the mouth of the Indus region. The route around the Arabian Peninsula and into the Red Sea was navigated from 3000 BCE onwards. Some major trade centers reserved their importance for long periods of time. Traders transported large cargoes by water routes whenever possible, particularly for long distance trade. During the third dynasty of Ur, boats on the canals carried from about 55 to 155 bushels of grain. At Lagash alone, there were 125 boatmen or one-tenth of the population of the Temple of Bao. The boatmen, including the rovers and helmsmen, were free. Male and female slaves were allocated to graves and also belonged to the individual sailors. Sumerian texts describe the boat building and other allied activities. The boat right constructed the shell of his vessel first without any interior framework. Although the technical vocabulary was very extensive, we are unable to identify the terms, however. Boat building was a large operation and very large boats were constructed from wood in exceptional shipyards. These boats were possibly used for long sea voyages to places such as Meluha and even Dilman. Two types of boats, one the coracle and second the calic, were characteristics of the Mesopotamian period and have survived in identical form even today. The coracle was a type of round basket similar to the ones used by laborers for carrying earth and bricks on top of their heads and this was termed as kupu which means a round basket in Akkadian language and kufa in Arabic. The rushes were plaited into a shallow basket with a flat bottom covered with sickness and cake edges. 
At the same time, the boat was navigated by two to four men with oars. When loaded, the cargoes and gunwale cleared the water by only a few inches. The coracle sailors could cross fast flowing rivers like the Tigris and they traveled up and down the river carrying goods. The raft, called in Akkadian language as Ka Laku and in Arabic Kalek, was made of the strongest reeds that grew in the marshes or preferably of the best wood the builder could find nearby. Its buoyancy was augmented by attaching inflated goat skinners below its surface. The loaded rafts floated down the river with the current and the sailors were using poles to propel and steer them till they reached their destination. These rafts were predominantly useful in parts of the rivers with rapids and shallows because despite the loss of some skinners, the raft still kept afloat. When the calic reached its destination, the cargo was unloaded, the wood was sold and the goat skinners deflated and loaded on the donkeys to form a caravan to travel towards north. Now talking about the crafts and labor, the words, you know, specialist in Sumerian and Akkadian encompassed certain craftsmen, artists and academics that is individuals with specialized knowledge or abilities. The words for many craftsmen were pre-Sumerian and belonged to substrate languages. Knowledge of crafts was learned by different methods including oral teaching, apprenticeship and writing in case of the scribes. Crafts were regularly taught within families or clans. Training was very long, as much as eight years for a house builder and four for a seal cutter. Sometimes the craftsmen were slaves, but only wealthy families could afford to have skilled slaves. Half of the surviving apprenticeship contracts were written on behalf of the influential Agibi family. The earliest records of jewelers' workshops are from the third dynasty of Ur. A record from Ur mentions that the business of a large workshop was divided into eight departments that is, metal workers, goldsmiths, stone cutters, blacksmiths, leather workers, felters, carpenters, and reed workers. The texts also contain deliveries of things to these craftsmen and orders for number of objects. Artists adapted works from their own culture, thus reviving ancient forms. A tablet from Sippar depicting a statue of the god Shahmash was made as an imitation of an ancient portrait. Ancient objects were repeatedly preserved for long periods of time. For example, the stele of Naram Sen was publicly displayed for more than 1000 years. Artists may also have been influenced by antiquities and relics found in the ground. A letter contains references about finding of beads from the ground at many ancient sites. Now we'll be talking about seals and sealings. Since the invention of writing, seals have been in use for many purposes. When rolled over a lump of clay, the seal marked the certification of a contracting party or witness. Cylinder seals were commonly made from colorful hard stones such as green and red jaspers, dark green serpentines, transparent cords, hematite and even lapis lazuli. The color of the seal was mainly associated with the fate of its owner. Individuals could also own and use more than one seal, either concurrently or chronologically. A new seal could be used to indicate service under a different monarch or different seals were frequently used to reflect changes in an official's standing. Royal seals have been recognized by a carved inscription citing a royal name. Seals were given by the king to numerous high-ranking administrative officials. 
officials were also allowed to use the seals that many kings held. The kings occasionally also possessed personal dynastic and heirloom seals. Also, there were seals belonging to the gods and statues of the gods were sometimes depicted wearing those seals. Gods authenticated their letters to rulers by sealing them. Divine seals were also used to seal significant documents such as treaties. Seals were also worn hanging from pins or suspended at the wrist. The Sumerian word for wrist was literally seal holder. In one of the royal cemetery at Ur, Queen Pobi was buried in full regalia wearing crossed gold pins with lapis lazuli beads and hanging from one of the pins was her lapis lazuli cylindrical seal. From the second millennium BCE, seals usually hung from a loop and were worn around the neck. Seals were also used as gifts to the gods, funeral offerings to the dead and personal possessions taken to the graves of their owners. It is mentioned in the sources that women even wore their husband's seals to the grave and even vice versa. From around the 3rd millennium BC, the Sumerians quickly switched to the Persian Gulf for trade in copper. This trade involved a substantial amount of copper. A text from Ur dates to the reign of Rim Sin of Larsa recorded the receipt of copper in Dilman, presumably from Magan, which weighed as per the standard of Ur 18,333 kilograms. One third of this copper was earmarked for delivery to A. Nasir of Ur, a merchant who had close dealings with the Dilman and Magan copper trade. The institutions gave artisans time and freedom from financial constraints to experiment and come up with new innovations in addition to providing money for investments. Though crafts were usually taught orally, manuals such as the farmer's instructions and other works on horse training, glass making, cooking and beer brewing were also composed. Also, the technical vocabulary of the craftsmen was recorded. In the Akkadian period, a state workshop was organized under the direction of one of the chief officials in the palace to supervise the colossal royal decoration of the temples. The administration was concerned with the supply and control of valuable materials. During the reign of Sharhadon, there were state workshops located in the royal arsenals built in mean cities. When the capital moved to Nineveh, the building was no longer used to make armaments for campaigns and most of the workshops were turned into stores or living quarters. In Lagash, both the workers of the third dynasty of Ur and the royal subjects of the pre-Saganic dynasty performed state service by turn a month at a time. When they were formally called to duty, they were labelled as serving their turn, for which they received rations. When employed outside their formal time, they were described as sitting out their turn. Off duty, they were free agents and received wages. These workers commonly worked during the winter months on jobs such as dike repairing and canal clearing. The balance of power between the institutions and the private sector has been a challenging task for scholars to document. A formal transfer of power from temples to palace took place between 2500 and 1500 BC. The most apparent example was Shulgi's nationalization of the temples. In order to manage the state economy, the principal temples of Lagash and other cities were put under the control of secular officials. Temples were allocated accountants by the state also. Under Hammurabi, this practice continued with the state usurpation of local institutions. Now we'll be talking about the significance of urbanism in the non-agrarian setup of ancient Mesopotamia. Scholars agree 
that the creation of cities as a result of the thriving trade may very well be the Mesopotamian civilization's greatest enduring legacies. There is much more to cities and towns than just dense population. When the economy develops in areas other than food production, it is favorable for developing more metropolitan areas. In addition to food production, these sectors include trade, manufacturing and services. Cities and towns are not just places with enormous populations. Eredo, which was an ancient Sumerian city south of Ur, was revered as the oldest city in Sumer. Its patron god was Enki, which was the lord of the sweet waters that flows under the earth. The city was founded on sand dunes, most probably in the 5th millennium BC, and it wholly illustrated the sequence of the pre-literate Ubaid civilization period. Also, it shows the long succession of superimposed temple structures. The temples portrayed the growth and development of elaborate mud brick architecture. Erik, which was an another city, was located northwest of Ur. It was one of the greatest cities of Sumer, which was enclosed by brickwork walls around 10 kilometers in circumference, which according to the legend were built by the mythical hero whose name was Gilgamesh. It is pertinent to mention that features of urban life patterns, what manifested more in the Eric Jamdat Nasser period in Mesopotamia, is more fully illustrated at Eric than at any other Mesopotamian city. The city of Kish was located east of Babylon. A king of Kish, namely Mesilim, is known to have been the author of the earliest extant royal inscription. The same royal inscription recorded his arbitration of a boundary dispute between the south Babylonian cities of Lagash and Umma. Lagash was one of the most important capital cities of Sumer. It was located midway between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The city is believed to have been founded in the Ubaid period somewhere between 5200 and 3500 BC. In the early dynastic period, the rulers of Lagash called themselves king, which means Lugal. This city, under the control of Sagan of Akkad and Godia, prospered enormously. Lagash was endowed with many temples, including the Inenu, which was House of the Fifty, which became a seat of the major god Enlil. It is also worthy to mention that architecturally, the most remarkable structure, dam-like structure, with a regulator in the shape of sluice gates, which conserved the area's water supply in reservoirs. Ur was the ancient city situated about 225 kilometers southeast of the site of Babylon. The city came under prominence during the reign of kings of the first dynasty of Ur. The excavation shows the progress and remarkable development of art in the city of Ur. A remarkable discovery was of the custom whereby kings were buried along with a whole retinue of their court officials, servants and women etc. who were privileged to continue their service in the next world. A few personal inscriptions of the Sagan of Akkad reveal the material progress of the timers. Now to conclude this today's lecture, one would say that in addition to agriculture, commerce was the second most important source of the Mesopotamian wealth. A flourishing trade was established with most of the surrounding areas and other contemporary far off places. A bulk of both imports and exports were attested in different dynastic periods of the Mesopotamian history. All the familiar agents of business were highly developed. Bills, receipts, notes and letters of credit were more frequently used. So this is uh, all what we have to study in the non-agrarian economy of ancient Mesopotamia. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. 
Thank you so much. Thank you.